A new cornerback joins the Vikings, but who does that mean the odd man out is? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much to those of you who listen to this show every single day day. My hashtag everydayers, I appreciate y'all so very much. Thank you so much for keeping this thing going, especially as we get into the deeper parts of the off season. If you are new here, hello and welcome. My name is Luke and you can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening app like Sirius XM or even YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. We'll start out today's show by talking about Shaquille Griffin, who joins the Vikings. He's been in the league since 2017. Uh, very much a veteran presence corner, and he's been a starter for almost all of that time. Uh, mostly you might remember him on Seattle playing with his brother Shaquem for a minute. That was pretty cute. Uh, but now he's been a little bit more of a journeyman lately, spent a bunch of time in Houston, ended up in Carolina, uh, and now here he is. So he's bounced around the league a little bit, and I, I will, I think, eventually get to uh, watching him maybe just to see, although we have kind of gotten into the point of the off season where we're seeing a lot more like low octane, like I'll call them competition tier sightings where like the system I have for like parsing out the roster is there's like starter tier guys that are like Justin Jefferson, right? Like if they will start every rep, that's the guy. Uh, and then there's competition to your guys. I would call that like Sam Darnold, right? Or I think Shaquille Griffin will be here, like Jerry Tillery, where they'll probably have a job. They'll probably have to compete for the job or compete for a share of the snaps at their job or whatever. And then you have like backup to your guys that are just there to be depth and then, you know, roster bubble dudes and long shots and all that. But uh, I, I kind of see, you know, between starter and backup as a lot of these signings that we have had lately. Jonah Williams from the Rams, uh, Jerry Tillery, most recently of the Raiders. They were bringing Jihad Ward, uh, who also I think would fall into that tier. Uh, he's in for a visit. I don't know if he actually signed. I don't think he did, but he's in Minnesota. He's visiting. He was uh, like an outside linebacker type for the, for the Giants. Um, and then you have Shaquille Griffin. I, I don't know what he can still do uh, at this particular stage in his career. I mean, he's not like ancient or anything like that, but perhaps falling away a little bit. Um, but uh, instead of kind of trying to speak off the dome about his ability, I'd rather like hold until I've you know really seen a little bit more. And, and more so, let's just take a quick stock of that room because th this is the first D-back that the Vikings have added this offseason. And that DB's room, kind of the story of the offseason or of this of the 2023 season is that that room was better than we thought it was going to be. I, I was actually really concerned about it going into the season. They super proved me wrong or, or at least proved me not quite as right uh, under that Brian Flores scheme. Now, you could argue that that Brian Flores scheme had to sacrifice in other areas to paper over what may be a deficiency at cornerback. Uh, but nonetheless, they were given a job and they executed it. And then that scheme worked like a whole bunch of times, right? So the problem is, will it continue to work in the future? Right? And, and and the way the season ended for the Vikings, there's that's a pretty big question mark. So maybe you just need a little bit more raw talent. A little bit of competition can can work out there. And, you know, competition, you, there is the old adage of, you know, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks, right? Where if you if, if you have two guys and none of neither of them are clear enough, like as a starter, to like just be the guy and not be questioned. Maybe they both kind of stink. And I think there's probably something going on here with that. But but what we're going to see is I'm going to guess you get like some deference to the veteran experience of Shaquille Griffin. And maybe he starts out with the ones. But a guy like, you know, Caleb Evans, um, I think Booth has a chance or he'll have, we'll say, an opportunity 
to take that job if he shows out in camp. Of course, you know, Shaquille Griffin, part of that. I'm going to guess Byron Murphy, you can pencil him as a, him in as a starter. But then you've got like Evans, Booth, Griffin, and Makai Blackman. And, and uh, among those four, you kind of pick two or three that get to rotate in. And maybe somebody gets cut, right? Maybe somebody who is in, on their rookie contract gets released. Or maybe we just say, okay, these guys are our depth. And the, the odd man out is like Joe Juan Williams, who's on a futures contract, right? Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a draft pick, probably not a high one, like a day three guy that also joins that competition. And then you've got a little bit of competition. And hey, that that's the, the, the glory of competition is not necessarily that it guarantees that one of these guys is going to play better than than we understand them to be, but rather that it gives them all the opportunity to. Um if you think of each player as a as a bell curve of outcomes, right? Some players are going to totally pop off and, and be way better than we expect, and some players will be worse than we expect. Most of them will be somewhere in between. And if you think of those bell curves, they're all going to like overlap on each other. If you look overlaid every player's bell curve on each other. Some players have higher ceilings. Some players have higher floors and stuff. But really, there's going to be a lot of overlap. And if you think of, you know, competitions, let's say each guy, one of these guys, just to keep it simple, is a coin flip to be good or bad, right? And if you have five of these and you need to hit three coin flips, like your odds are going to be better if you have five coins to flip than if you have three coins to flip, right? Like that's the probabilistic idea of competition. But it also, I think it just gives people something to fight for in camp and that tends to bring out the best in people, right? It challenges, especially NFL players, you know, with with the mentality that NFL players have, it can bring out the best in them. I'm a big fan of competition. Of course, it would be great if you just had like three unquestioned superstars. You let me know when you find them in an affordable way. Because <laughs> I think, I don't know, man, the, the unquestioned superstars we have on the roster, people want to trade them for draft picks. So I, I don't know if maybe that's even what people want. But uh <laughs> I, I the the other angle on this is the compensatory pick angle. Speaking of, you know, affordability, the Vikings were before the Shaquille Griffin signing in line for two third round comp picks. I spoke about that in depth yesterday, so we should probably update that. He signs a deal one year deal worth up to six million dollars. As of this recording, I do not know how much of that is salary, bonus, incentive, etc. Uh, and that's going to be really important because of the way the compensatory formula works. If all of that is salary, which it isn't because it's an up it's reported as an up to. So some amount of that is either like workout bonus, roster bonus, uh incentives probably. Um but if that were a 6 million dollar contract, he would count as a compensatory free agent. He would actually cancel out one of the Vikings comp picks. So again, the way the 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 formula works is you count up how many compensatory eligible free agents you lost and how many that you gained. For the Vikings, they lost six and they have now gained five. This Shaquille Griffin is the fifth, which means they are eligible for one compensatory pick. And when deciding what round that compensatory pick is, like cancels like uh, from your gains and your losses. So if you lost a guy that signed for a $4 million deal, but you signed a guy to a $4 million deal, the comp picks for those two will cancel out. Uh, Shaquille Griffin being a $6 million deal, unfortunately, all that's left is two third rounders. So because one of those is the closest one to him, it'd be the Daniil Hunter one, uh, He gets that one gets canceled out, and now we're just left with the Kirk Cousins third round pick. As it stands right now, if Shaquille Griffin's contract makes enough. But here's the rub. Um, a, there was a little bit of confusion about the fact that, so he got cut from the Texans who had signed him in free agency. He was uh, like a mid-season, uh, so he had like a mid-season run with the Texans when Desmond King was hurt and sort of as a depth piece. And then when Desmond King came back, they they waived him and the Panthers claimed him on waivers. He played a couple games with the Panthers. And so this it's the Panthers compensatory free agent. He was on the Panthers roster at the end of the season. And so he, he does count. I don't think the waiver thing makes a difference. Correct me if I'm wrong, if we find out. Um, but the other thing is the structure of that contract is going to determine whether or not this actually does cancel out a compensatory pick. And you're looking the magic number, probably like 3 million in incentives. If it's like half incentive, 
And those incentives, by the way, have to be not likely to be earned incentives, meaning they have to be something he did not accomplish last year, which they probably are because he bounced around to, between teams. He wasn't on the uh, on a playoff team. So if it's like, you know, you get one million dollars per playoff win or something like that, or, you know, a million dollars for a Pro Bowl or something like that, like all stuff that he didn't do, um, then that that would help this. And you just kind of have to hope that it's it's not enough to bump that third round pick away. Um, if it is, then you just kind of have to accept that that Kwesi's evaluation here is that Shaquille Griffin is worth more than a third round pick next year. Uh, and the, the money, the $6 million is pretty small. So that much money, a small amount of money in a third round pick next year for Shaquille Griffin, like he thinks that you know, that will do more than waiting a year and picking a Makai, a Makai Blackman, that he thinks that that's a more valuable piece. And I think base, like, I, I don't think a lot of people would agree, but you, you you can at least, like, accept that as a viewpoint and, like, move forward understanding that that's the way he's thinking about the situation. There are some other contract details and stuff that I want to go over with you. And then since we've got a little bit of time and there are a lot of questions from yesterday's mailbag that I wanted to answer that I ran out of time and could not answer. So I'm actually just going to get to those. We're just going to keep mailbagging. I hope nobody minds. I, You know what? I don't care if you mind. We're doing it anyways. We'll do that next. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by eBay Motors. They have everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level that thing up to peak performance. Look, your car is a part of your life. It's a part of who you are. And you got to take care of that thing. If it's making a noise or whatever and you need a part, eBay Motors can get you hooked up. They have 122 million parts and they have the eBay guaranteed fit where your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. But it's not just the boring stuff under the hood. They also have some of the more fun upgrades like LED headlights, superchargers, roof racks, that kind of thing. With eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and the part of your life that it's supposed to be. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Today is Wednesday, March 20th. And today at 7 p.m. Eastern time, that'd be 6 p.m. Central, uh, you can go to the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel and find the MLB season preview, a live show with all of the local experts on all the MLB teams previewing the 2024 MLB season. That includes Brandon Warren, who does Locked On Twins and all of your other favorite baseball teams. You can find that on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Let's move on here, and I've got some contract details to upgrade you on. We've got some void years, baby. We're back. <laughs> it's the Vikings doing void years stuff again. Uh, seethe accordingly, if you're somebody who gets really mad at that for some reason. But um, the main one that I wanted to update you on, this is from uh, reporting from Ben Gessling, is Andrew Van Ginkel who got uh, $10 million guaranteed at signing. Uh, most of it is in a signing bonus. Most of that $10 million is in a signing bonus, $7 million of it, and it is extended through four void years that extend after the life of his two-year contract, so out into 2028. Um, that actually spreads things out fairly thin, so that ends up not being a lot of money pushed way out into the future if you're super worried about like borrowing from future years and future capital and stuff. Um, if he plays out his contract as it is structured, the Vikings will incur a 4.2 dead cap pen, a 4.2 mil dead cap penalty in 2026, where the cap will probably be well over $300 million. So that'll be nothing. Um, that's pretty nice. The, the, Interesting thing, so he's actually got an extra void year that the money can't spread out through, which is actually kind of nice because you can see how it works. Uh, if you go to like over the cap, it's nice. It's like visual. It makes sense. So he's got a void year in 2029 that there is no money in, uh, but he has a $10 million cap hit in 2025. So it gives the Vikings options here. And that's really what this is meant to um the, the reason the contract is structured this way and it's not just let's just pay him, you know, this, you know, seven million this year, seven million next year or whatever the total contract is uh, 
it gives them options. So for one, he's a cuttable asset in 2025. I think he's got an 11 or $12 million cap hit is, is the total. And they can save about half of that by cutting him. Let's say Andrew Van Ginkle just kind of falls apart. I don't think so, by the way. I managed to, I, I've finally gotten to him watching tape. I like him. He's cool. He, uh, not only is there a lot of versatility, like he'll actually play like overhang or like apex, which is pretty crazy for like a guy that's mostly a pass rusher. But as like an edge setter, um, he holds his spot and he's also very evasive, very active hands. I like what he does in the pass rush. I like the way he's done. I actually really like this dude. Uh, so I'm, I'm stoked on him. But let's say I'm super wrong and he totally falls apart. Uh, he can they can just cut him and that's all right. Maybe they even post June cut him or whatever if you want to do that. And, and that's OK. Uh, if they do cut him in 2025, by the way, they would save like six mil and incur a dead cap penalty of like five mil. And that five mil includes the 4.2 that was supposed to be in 2026. That would also accelerate up to 2025. And then you just be done with it after 2025. Um, or let's say he plays really well, like really well. And you're like, Oh my God, we, let's, let's actually lock this guy up for a little longer. You totally can because he has void years that already will, uh, that, that will spread out any additional signing bonus you want to give him. And then you can maybe turn those void years into actual real years. You can extend him to a contract that's, you know, three, four years long. And then you just have the normal structure. Um, he'll be getting into his thirties by then. So obviously that'll be part of the calculus, but Hey, the option is available, right? We love to have options. We don't have to take them all. Or you can just do a, a normal restructure. He'll have a lot of base salary in 2025, and you can convert that into signing bonus if you find out that you have a cap issue. The Vikings have like 120 mil in cap in 2025, so I don't know if that's a button that they're going to end up having to push. However, that does not include potential extension money for Justin Jefferson, for Christian Derisaw, uh, for, you know, whatever you might have to do at quarterback, which I think they have to leave some options open to maybe spend money on a quarterback. If they hit free agency and you struck out in the draft or like that's a permutation that can happen. And, and while I don't think that it's likely, you probably should leave your, your salary cap options like flexible so you can maneuver in that situation. If it does come up right elsewhere, uh, you've got Jerry Tillery making $2.75 million and up to 1 million in additional incentives so that's very much like backup slash. I think he's going to compete kind of money. Uh, and I still kind of have this like fear that he's going to play a little bit more than we think based on what that contract implies. Uh, but we'll see. Right. I mean, obviously, like camp is your opportunity to earn the job. That's another thing. Good thing about competition is, you know, jobs are earned, not given. Uh, you've got to come into this building and prove something before we just start giving you playing time based on your contract or whatever. And I think that's really healthy. And then I don't think I've gone over Blake Cashman's salary, which has a $7.75 million signing bonus over the three-year life of it. No void your shenanigans here. But the base salary is like heavily backloaded and not guaranteed at all. So this guy, again, would be another pretty easy cut, especially in 2026, where that, I mean, he'd have a cap number of $10 million. That's actually pretty palatable. And it should be noted that on March 15th of next year, a bunch of his 2025 money gets guaranteed. So he's not going to be very cuttable in 2025 in camp or anything like that. But if you wanted to do the cap casualty thing, you could do that uh, after the league year starts, but before the, the money all guarantees. I'll have like a two day window to do that. If he's just this total catastrophe, which again, I don't anticipate. I like Blake Cashman. Um, that means that the Vikings are working with some pretty decent cap numbers still. And they definitely have not gotten to the point where it's like okay all we can do is our draft class like they're definitely not done here so we'll just have to keep our eyes open before i get into some of the like leftover questions from yesterday i also want to mention that netflix is coming out with another series that's gonna have a viking in it if you're into that receiver it'll it's like the spiritual successor to the quarterback series that had kirk cousins in it and justin jefferson's in this one so you know have fun with that try not to be too insane uh, <laughs> we can't listen to him talk without going completely crazy Anyways, uh, so there's a bunch of uh, mailbag questions that I want to get to, uh, and I didn't get a chance to get to last time, which kind of stinks. So we're going to just do that and uh, wrap out the show from there. All right. Sound good? No, I don't care. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Uh, March Madness is here. The first four have already happened as of or have started as of this recording. And if you want to get started with FanDuel, boy, 
do I have an opportunity for you? You can get 200 bucks in bonus bets if your first $5 bet at FanDuel wins. So new customers, go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Bet on any college hoops game. You can bet on South Carolina women's to beat whatever their 16 seed is, which will... If that doesn't happen, the world will end, and you can get 40 to 1 on that. I mean, come on, you're never going to find odds like that on that kind of game anywhere else. That is 200 bucks on a $5 bet if that bet wins uh, in bonus bets, and you can use that on point spreads, money lines. You can try to pick who's going to win the whole tournament if you want. So if your bracket gets busted immediately, which happens to me all the time, why don't you head over on to FanDuel so you can keep on playing that college hoops game. Once again, that is FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, just a few miscellaneous questions here on a Locked On Vikings podcast because I found some of these kind of interesting and I wanted to make sure that I got to them uh, without making everybody wait so long. Some of these are already outdated, like scene season asks, do you feel as if Dane Lowry made as much of a con- contribution as fans think he did? None. <laughs> and did I miss something on tape? Well, so part of it is that Dean Lowry was hurt for a lot of the season. So like that's going to temper the contribution. What I saw on tape, I did not like. Now, I've, I've been like talking a bunch of smack on, on Dean Lowry. I don't think it was like the worst D lineman, you know, I've ever seen or anything like that. But like he did get washed out of the point of attack like a bunch. Like he didn't hold up to doubles. And that was kind of part of his job as like a five tech on zone. You're going to, you're going to get like tackle guard doubles. You got to hold up on those. And, and I didn't really love the way that he did that. Um, didn't really see a ton of contribution. And I think he got like one, one sack. And I don't think you saw like a big pressure generation thing from an interior guy. He kind of was just like absorbing space and not in the way that you love it when D tackles like absorb space and are these unmovable things because he wasn't unmovable. That's that's my deal with Dean Lowry. And it's sort of my concern with replacing him with this amalgamation of other guys that uh, like have these, you know, super exploitable weaknesses. But again, we'll see what competition brings you. Uh, another one I wanted, I kind of set aside for, for later, which is now comes from Bradley Norris says the Vikings must have intention intentionally told the media that the entire brass is going to see JJ McCarthy's pro day and have a private practice. What's the reasoning behind sharing that information ahead of time? So I don't know if it's really that deep, but there was, so there's a, the like private workout wording is so weird. That's a top 30 visit. This, they do this with 30 draft picks every year. And, and of course, the quarterbacks are going to like be part of it. And I think other quarterbacks got top 30 visits with the Vikings, if not like private combine visits, which um, can sort of serve the same purpose without consuming one of your like 30 private visits, which a lot of times teams will want to use those on potential day three guys or whatever. Um, but it's going to get this like really big traction in the media, obviously, because ooh, JJ McCarthy, you know, Vikings is like it. Look at like my YouTube numbers when I put a college quarterback in the thumbnail versus when I do anything else. People are thirsty for it. They're going to go crazy for it. And I get it. And I will give that to you. Uh, but the reason to like leak that is probably not purposeful this time because I just don't think it's very high octane. I think that's just like a, just people are friends with reporters and reporters are doing their job. Um, that's, I mean, that, that is the job, right? Is to establish relationships. So they will share information like that with you. Uh, and, and in terms of pro day, there's not really any use of trying to keep any secrets as to who's going to who's pro day for one. Yeah. The Vikings are going to be at all the QB pro days, right? Like if anything, it was news that they didn't have like top above the line brass at Oregon's pro day where Bo Nix was, they did have people there. But like they had scouting people there, but they did not have, you know, Kevin O'Connell and Quasey like themselves didn't show up. And though they've been showing up to other quarterback pro days. So th- you can look around, right? There are people who's who's like part of their beat is to look around at pro days and see like, oh, who's here? Who's with who? Right. Look at the name tags who, you know, what teams are represented. Uh, and so unless guys are like walking in with like Groucho Marx disguises, like. You're not going to keep that a secret anyways. So yeah, it's, it's going to get out because that's just reporters asking questions that I don't think really anybody minds answering. There's no reason to keep it secret. Mitch D asks in a world where the Falcons lose their draft pick outright due to tampering, bear with me, how much more valuable would the Vikings two first round picks be? Um, I guess this depends on the trade chart you're looking at, you're looking at, which is a good, like the, the, I guess, go-to thing um, with valuing draft picks. But 
whatever it is, you know, the, the 11th pick functionally turns into the 10th overall pick, right? 23 turns into 22. So it would be that much more valuable. What would you trade to, to move 11 to 10 and 23 to 22? Um, probably like a, it's worth like a day three pick. Um, it's, it's kind of like, I still kind of don't know how much the Falcons are going to get in trouble for that. I'm, I, I am sure they will get something. I bet some principal actors, like the people that cousins named on the podium will probably get a fine. And I wonder if they'll get some sort of slap on the wrist draft penalty, you know, a day three pick gets moved to the back of the round or something like that. I don't see them losing pick eight. And to be honest, the draft is coming up kind of fast. I don't even know if the NFL finishes this fast enough. This might be something that that is applied to the 2025 draft. Um, Scooter asks, if Cousins is too expensive and can't take the Vikings far in the playoffs, why endorse signing a bridge QB that has even less chance? What's the point? Wouldn't it be logical to save the money and play Mullins and build a roster elsewhere, hoping someday you once again have a top 10 QB? Um... You get a top 10 QB is the answer to that question. Yeah, I I, I don't think I, I think like the the idea of this, by the way, this question was asked like forever ago. So it'd be nice. But um, the idea that Sam Darnold is going to come in and start the entire season and that that's plan A, that's not the move. If he starts the whole season, something has gone wrong. Either the Vikings didn't get the quarterback they want or they did get a quarterback and that guy isn't ready for a whole year, which I think it constitutes, you know, I mean, that would be OK, right? We, we got to be patient with our rookies, but that's not plan A, right? That's something manageable, but it's obviously not how you would draw it up if you could control every single outcome. Uh, the point of a bridge QB is to keep you afloat for a little while, right? We don't need Sam Darnold to do a playoff run. That's that's what I'm getting at here we did need Kirk Cousins to do a playoff run. And and like my chief concern of Kirk Cousins is consistency game to game to game. His ability to put together, to string together four really good games in a row happened, what, twice the whole time he was there? That's how you have to win the Super Bowl, right? You have to win four games in a row to win the Super Bowl. I didn't think he could do that. I don't think Sam Darnold can do that for sure. Oh my God, no, no way. But he won't have to. By then, ideally, the rookie has taken over and he's the reason, right? So he just needs to kind of be mediocre and keep the ship afloat until the 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 rookie is ready to take over. And hopefully you're still in a good enough position on your season that if the rookie does take over and totally explode, you're still in the standings and you can make a push out of it. That is the logic. Um, is that, you know, uh, does that make you a top two team? No, but if you have to be a top two team to like justify doing anything, this sport is not for you. Last one comes from Norm McDonald, which I love, who asks, was Quasi a DEI hire? I'm really glad that you asked this question. I see this uh, opinion a lot, and I love the excuse to kind of dive into that. So for those of you who aren't steeped in like the American culture war, DEI is now the new term for like anything that is has to do with like racial diversity that I don't like. Um, but it stands for like diversity, equity, and inclusion or something like that. But it's essentially the idea of, of, you know, companies appointing people to make sure that they're being properly respectful of diversity and their practices and stuff. Um, and so a DEI hire, the idea is that he did, wasn't actually qualified for the job. He only got hired because he was black. That's what Norm is getting at here. Did that happen? The answer is no. Um, he does have an unorthodox resume, Right. But I think that's why he got the job. That's what they wanted, right? If you wanted somebody with a whole bunch of like super traditional experience, you could have kept Rick Spielman. The Vikings were going away from that, right? So somebody that's totally out of the, out of left field from an analytics department with a, a different mindset, with a plan that now that we're seeing what the plan is and thinking back to 2022 and Quasey basically pitched, yeah, we'll run this out with Kirk for two years and then we'll we'll probably trade up really hard if and, and you know, or trade up if we have to, if we're too low in the draft order and we'll get a QB of the future and then we'll kind of really go into our rebuild. That's the pitch, the plan that he pitched and the Wilfs went with it. Um, but, but the unorthodox nature of Quasi's experience, um, which by the way, I mean, he's still, he's been in NFL front offices for 10 years. It's not like this dude is new and never looked at football before. He's very humble about his knowledge. Um, but I mean, he still could probably talk circles around you and me. So give him a little bit of the respect that he is due. Uh, there is a quote from, I think it was Ziggy Wilf during that process that I think got everybody frothing at the mouth a little bit. That was like, they did, you know, want somebody that they did want like minority candidates. 
But uh, for whatever it's worth, and I don't know what this is worth to you, when those when the, when the eight finalists were listed, for one, there were some white guys on there, so chill out. They can they they considered them, uh, but for two, I, I I ranked those, and Quasi was at the top of my list. Tomorrow on the show. I kind of want to talk more about Andrew Van Ginkle. I don't know. He's like just wormed into my brain. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do something else. Whatever it is, I hope you're along for the ride. I'll see you all tomorrow. And as always, Skull.